Welcome to the Why Isn't It Working Business and Tech Podcast, talking all things business and tech in the emerging and enterprise space. Here are your hosts, Carl Wood and Michael Hamilton. Welcome to the podcast. Here today we have Ross Edwards from Ripple, who is a cross-border payments company on blockchain. How are you going today, Ross? Great, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's uh, thanks for having me today. It's uh, always good to talk about uh, technology, in particular blockchain and payments, of course. Well, it's a big thing we love here, eh, Carl? Always, mate. Always looking for ways to uh, yeah, get some money moved around the globe. So actually with that, Ross, um, tell us a bit about Ripple and some of the, the listeners as well. I mean, it's a very, very interesting area in the market. Michael's obviously big on, on blockchain himself, but um, this is something that's really starting to come into the forefront in the commercial world. So can you tell us a bit more about um, what, what your goal is and what you're doing there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Ripple is a cross-border payments company. Uh, it's was founded in 2012 uh, and started off, you know, very much in the open blockchain space. The founders were uh, from both a fintech and a block, uh, sorry, a Bitcoin background. They saw, you know, problems or limitations in Bitcoin and how it could be applied and, you know, could build a, a, a similar but different platform that could solve, you know, different problems. And, you know, based on that, they built out the XRP Ledger, which is an open source uh, project and a, you know, a global uh, public ledger, and have very much been always focused on making payments more efficient. And, and indeed, you know, the vision of the company, which, to be honest, has become somewhat cliche, but was quite innovative back then, was the Internet of Value and enabling value to move as easily as information does today on the Internet. And, and very much we see you know, the ability to provide infrastructure that moves value as this sort of third iteration of globalization. You know, um, you know much earlier we saw uh, innovation and standardization in goods and cargo, you know, the, the standard cargo uh, uh, containers and, and these sort of pieces that this wasn't always the case. It was a, an advent. Then we saw the globalization of information. It wasn't always as easy to get information, whether that's good or bad, is, is is up to people to judge on a global scale. It wasn't as easy to get views out there as, as it has been since the internet. And we see the same thing happening in payments and making it much easier, not just in paying money to your local shop, but indeed in the globalization of money you know, for consumers. Um, so that's what Ripple's focused on. You know, Off the back of that, we've built out uh, a set of uh, enterprise products, we engage you know, financial institutions and have built a network called, and this potentially isn't a very innovative name, but it's called RippleNet, uh, that consists of licensed financial institutions and provides a next generation infrastructure for making payments easier, cheaper, faster, and indeed building services that couldn't be built before. Uh, so that's really Ripple's focus. We're obviously part, you know, heavily involved in the XRP community, and that also plays a role, you know, the the, crypt, the digital asset XRP, and that plays a role in our products as well. In terms of myself, I am the global head of client solutions, so our, I lead our pre-sales efforts, uh, working with financial institutions around the world on how they can use RippleNet, how they can use Ripple's products to build services for their customers what the business case behind that is and how they would implement Ripple. Uh, so we have a team of people who work with our as part of our sales team around the world. Uh, I lead up that from a capability perspective and, and work you know, both internally and externally in, in uh, delivering that to market. Awesome. Thanks for that. So, I mean, I always try and gauge technology by, you know, when my mom taps me on the shoulder and asks me about something, I kind of know it's hit the mainstream, right? So, Bitcoin is one of these things where recently she came and said, oh, what's this all about? You know, what should I get involved in it? Um, and it's the interesting thing I've seen is that we've seen now you can't get a decent graphics card on the market anymore, which because they're being hoovered up for Bitcoin mining. Um, we're seeing, you know, multiple exchanges pop up and also have, you know, some pretty catastrophic failures as well. And Michael will probably test to a few of those. Um, yep. and I think the big thing that we're seeing as a problem though is around you know the clearances time. And I noticed with Ripple, you, know, you guys are sort of guaranteeing that to be at least like three seconds, which is massively quicker than Bitcoin. So what are some of the fundamental differences? And I know you can't go too much into it, but you know how, how is that achieved? 
Yeah, so in terms of XRP ledger, you know, it has similarities to Bitcoin and, and other platforms. Obviously, Ethereum's huge. You know, there, there are similarities, you know. So it's a, a autonomous system of record uh, that enables, you know, agreed transfer of information and indeed value between parties without a central clearing party. And it does that based on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Where they significantly di uh, differ is in you know, that protocol. So you know, Bitcoin famously uses a proof of work uh, mining basis to come to you know, consensus on the state of the data set. Because I mean, you gotta remember Bitcoin is just one big data set. XRP Ledger uses a process called consensus. Um, you know, th there are other methodologies. So proof of stake is another one that's, that's quite famous. Now, these work in different ways and they have different properties. And indeed, you know, Bitcoin's, you know, Bitcoin has some, what could be perceived as advantages over XRP Ledger and XRP Ledger has, you know, what could be perceived as, as advantages over Bitcoin, but it's all relative to what you're trying to achieve. The consensus protocol enables the update of a new ledger so essentially a new block you know, in terms of Bitcoin language every three to five seconds and with finality. So this is very important in that after that block is agreed by the consensus protocol across the participating peer-to-peer -peer node network, it cannot be changed. Whereas Bitcoin increases in certainty as additional blocks are added onto the chain. If someone can build a chain longer than that chain, starting at point X, everything after point X gets rewritten. So there is no certainty and finality in Bitcoin. There is an XRP ledger. And because of the protocol, it can or does create a new ledger every three to five seconds. And this produces different properties. Obviously, the latency is a, is a massive difference through that. So as opposed to waiting what actually ends up being 60 minutes, because you know the general uh, you know, approach in Bitcoin uh, transactions is to wait for six blocks to be mined until the transfer is you know, certain enough to be definite. Um, you can transfer XRP every three to five seconds. The throughput is massively different as well. XRP is an account-based uh, state in terms of data. Bitcoin is based on unspent transaction output. The throughput of XRP ledger has been you know, tested on the production network at thousands of transactions per second. Whereas, you know, Bitcoin famously has a very heavy restriction somewhere in the order of up to seven transactions a second limit. And that produces you know, significant scaling challenges and certainly a higher focus on what's called layer two protocols off chain uh, mechanisms. Uh, XRP ledger, of course, you know, consensus is also based on a voting mechanism and doesn't use the power output that Bitcoin uses, and that's seen as a great advantage, and, and it was a major driver for uh, the founders of, of the XRP ledger or the original developers of the XRP ledger to develop it. Uh, in terms of other aspects, XRP ledger in, in that validation, that consensus mechanism does require a localized level of trust between the validation nodes. You nominate nodes that you essentially trust. So there is a, a an element of trust in that validation process that there isn't in the mining process. And certainly that's a difference that should be considered. Fundamentally though, XRP Ledger has been built and made hyper-efficient for payments. Bitcoin is more of a uh, academic approach, uh, a general purpose approach, and you know, is useful for other things. And obviously, you know, platforms like Ethereum have been more tailored towards a logic machine, a smart contract machine, et cetera. And there are many other uh, networks out there that are that are you know, better for different use cases. But we think XRP Ledger and XRP specifically is the best digital asset for payments. That's really interesting. And I, I guess the big thing we're seeing now is, you know, and, and what's interesting for the future is, you know, Bitcoin obviously starts to come to fruition after the GFC where people were sort of, you know, disenfranchised with the current economic system, uh, you know, dumping of cash where cash had no real value when you started to look at it based back to a standard, you know, gold reserve or anything either. We're now coming up to COVID where governments around the world are, you know, pumping billions into their economy. I think the US has a plan to dump another $2 trillion in over the next few years as well. 
do you think that's going to drive more people to alternatives like Bitcoin, Ethereum, like Ripple? I mean, are people going to start to look at that based on, you know, I guess the devaluation of cash as a whole throughout society? I think that, you know, it's definitely going to drive interest and utilization of, you know, Bitcoin and, and XRP and, and other digital assets. Um, I think there's a question as to how mainstream will that be? Will that be, you know, still in, in niche communities? And, you know, the Bitcoin community is huge, but it's still niche on a global scale. Uh, will it be uh, more everyday people? Um, I think that that still remains to be seen, but certainly it will drive interest. It will drive use. From Ripple's perspective, we're much... Yeah, we are focused on long-term utility and use of XRP. And we certainly think in the movement of global value that XRP can play a role uh, of a neutral you know, bridge asset that can bring, um, you know, that can bring different networks and different uh, markets together. And I think that there's great benefit in that. Obviously, you know, internationally stuff, you know, generally will go through US dollar as the de facto you know, standard, but it, you know, it has a lot of problems with being a sovereign currency uh, and the control that US and US institutions you know, have over that. And we think that XRP can play a role there. So whilst I think there will be an impact at a consumer level, uh, yeah, Ripple really positions XRP as a tool for financial institutions, not as a replacement for fiat currency. And um, with um, National Ripple itself, does it handle fiat to fiat transfers and fiat to um, crypto? Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that is another major difference with the actual technology. Besides XRP, you know, compared to Bitcoin as, as a currency or a digital asset, the XRP ledger also supports... Um, the issuance of liabilities, uh, whether that is, you know, essentially stable coin, you know, a currency. So different uh, de decentralized exchanges can issue US dollars, uh, as an example, on XRP ledger, or whether that can be something like gold or, or something else that can be issued on the XRP ledger and managed on the XRP ledger and indeed exchanged for other assets on the ledger, whether those are liabilities or whether that's XRP. So, it does provide that. It, you know, in my view, it is a form of you know, logic and additional structure that can be placed on the network you know, in the same sort of space as, as getting to smart contracts. Smart contracts are much more open. That, you know, sort of We talk about this Turing complete. This is much more defined in what relationships and, and structured data can be placed on the, on the uh, network. But it is a very interesting space of, of XRP ledger and a major difference certainly to Bitcoin and other networks. And based on that, it wouldn't, I tell you, it would be a discussion around Ripple if you didn't ask this question. Um, is, are you a competitor to Swift in this case? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I joined Ripple in 2015. So this is a, you know, the, in, in Ripple years, that's, that's quite some time. And I, I think when we, in, you know, I certainly, when I joined, we were you know, more focused on banks and you know, comparing to what can SWIFT do versus what Ripple can do. There is a long history between the organizations. And indeed, you know, I remember being, I think it was in 2017 at Cybos in Geneva, uh, which is SWIFT's conference and, and Ripple was attending. And in the middle of the conference, uh, Finextra published an article about uh, Ripple being the unwanted guest who steals SWIFT's girlfriend at the party. Uh, and that was a very awkward situation. So there's certainly been a lot in terms of media and mindshare. And I like to think that Ripple's been you know, part of a broader fintech effort that has driven innovation from Swift. If you look at GPI, it's really the first fundamental uh, innovation we've seen in Swift in decades, uh, literally. And I think that we've been sort of part of that. But in reality, you know, we think that Swift is built on an antiquated architecture that has been built for very large corporates and has been built for very large correspondence servicing those corporates. It's not built for the you know, future customers of cross-border transactions. And these are individuals. These are small businesses. These are small businesses paying thousands of dollars, maybe even hundreds of dollars to many different suppliers across many different countries, not really large, you know, corporates paying $10 million to two uh, 
uh, suppliers. So when I, you know, I meet with many financial institutions, both banks and non-banks, our conversations are not based on how they can do a transaction on Ripple better than they currently do it on Swift. I talk to them about how can they do services that they cannot efficiently deliver to their customers today using their existing infrastructure, you know, predominantly Swift. How can they build a high performance business around these services that scales and, and, and maintains agility with the changing customer needs and, the, and their changing business strategies? And, and how can they take advantage of, of opportunities and challenges in that space? So yeah, overall, I think in, in terms of PR, in terms of uh, yeah, different publications, and, and discussions, particularly at the bank level, yeah, absolutely, there's some competition with Swift. In terms of mindshare, there's some competition with Swift. But in terms of actual implementation and what we're seeing in the market, yeah, we don't really see Swift as a, as a competitor in that space. Because that's, that's fantastic. And also, so you're seeing a speed um, aspect to your business and a cost reduction for your clients. And so are you looking at the moment, is it more weighted towards um, business customers or B2B or is it B2C or, or is it just a 50-50 split? So we, we work, our, our customers are licensed financial institutions. So we don't uh, go direct to, to customer. Uh, we don't, you know, service merchants, et cetera, which you know, obviously is a business that needs extreme scale. We work with licensed financial institutions and we work with them as to how they can service their customers. We and RippleNet in particular is focused on high performance businesses built on low value, high velocity payments. And, you know, we see predominantly three different use cases in particular on the network around that. One is obviously consumer to consumer payments, uh, the majority being OFW remittance transactions, so foreign worker remittance transactions. Um, you know, we work with a lot of banks in India, for instance, which receives billions of dollars a year, you know, majority from Middle East. We work across these corridors. We also work across niche, you know, more lower volume corridors that traditionally have been very expensive and inefficient in that space. It definitely forms probably the majority, you know, the, the, the majority of services that we see on the network. There are other types of obviously consumer to consumer payments we see as well, student payments, um, you know, cross-border bill payments and other aspects. Uh, secondly, we, we do see a lot of B2B payments on the network. Um, these are predominantly small to medium-sized enterprises paying suppliers uh, in different markets. This is a huge space. And you, know, you can see that this is very competitive in the market. If you look at the market in this space, banks lost the market in consumer to consumer payments long ago. If you look at the market in B2B payments, this is where FinTech is attacking. If you look at TransferWise's ads these days, it's about the open your business account on TransferWise. We can do your payments overseas. So the, the small to medium sized enterprise market is growing massively in every single market that I've been in, which trust me is, is, is plenty. Um, and the small to medium sized enterprise of today is obviously the corporate of tomorrow. So it's a very important space for banks and for payment companies. And we have a lot of services and interest in that space. The third one that is, of course, growing and, and you know, huge as well is platform disbursements. So how, do, how, do, how does Uber pay their drivers in India? Um, everything's routed back through Netherlands. It's a very complicated space. And you know, I, I've spoken to the head of payments you know, in Uber, actually, and he describes their company as more of a payments company than a taxi, taxi service. They have hundreds of APIs into different payment services to services. So if we can bring in consistency and one API that can fulfill that need, then that, that's a huge use case as well. It would be you know, the smaller of those three use cases, but we're seeing a lot of growth and a lot of interest there. And you know, we're looking to provide, you know, bring together a network that can service all three of those areas. So from that perspective, I mean, like you said, you're working with a lot of financial institutions. I mean, are you starting to work a lot more with some of these neo banks that are coming online as well within Australia? I mean, obviously, like you said, the established guys, the big four are going to be heavily invested with Swift and there's usually a bit of a, a transition across to any new sort of technology. But with the amount of neo banks popping up in Australia, are they like a rich target market for you guys as well? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And, and absolutely, we've had conversations with neobanks around the world. It's not just Australia where this is happening. Obviously, you know, it's the neobank market is much more mature in the UK, as an example. And even the US, we're seeing a lot of innovation in this space. Interestingly enough, we work with many different types of financial institutions. You know, looking at banks, we work with some of the world's biggest banks, you know, take Santander, for, you know, for instance, Standard Chartered and others. Uh, these are you know, global, truly global you know, banks. Uh, we work with regional banks. Uh, you know, some of our services, as an example, Sign Commercial Bank, one of the larger banks in Thailand. Very different profile to those multinational global banks. And we work with some very small niche banks looking to build differentiated services, either enabling their customers to access uh, services based on cross-border payments, you know, servicing, for instance, international student markets and otherwise, or looking to build a transactional business. In terms of the neo banks, they certainly fall into that latter category. And you know, I, I think one of the you know, the interesting discussions we have with neo banks is around, you know, what do they need to be successful? The first problem you've got being a neo bank, or this is my view at least, in, in Australia is how are you going to attract customers? We don't, you know, consumers. If you ask them, probably don't like the big four banks, but they trust the big four banks, right? And 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 it's a very sticky service. So how do you attract new customers? You know, you need to look at different markets. It's much easier to get a new customer than to convince a customer to change from a big four bank to Australia. So who's who's the new customers? Well, at least until COVID came along, it was sort of immigrants and international students. So I think it's a great space that um, neo banks can go after, and that's the conversations we, we've sort of had with them. Um, having said that, we work with a lot of older, traditional, bigger banks as well. So I think both are tar- in the target market of, of Ripple. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no worries. And the interesting thing, I guess, like you're talking about, you know, um, technology, which is allowing, you know, fast, secure transactions and standardization. And I mean, this is another thing, like you were saying before, you mentioned Uber. There are a lot of these type of companies now that are basically routing payments across the globe, currency exchanging, you know, all this information and the complexity in setting that up and maintaining it must be, you know, brutal, so to speak. So, I mean, is that something else that you guys are looking at, you know, providing some simplification around, you know, these sort of, you know, transactions without having to look at different standards for each, you know, country and what, you know, data needs to be sent in each payload and verified? Is that something you think RippleNet's really, really coolly designed for? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a it's a major factor, and and providing simplification in the technology uh, through standards, uh, through governance is critically important. And this is a huge topic, and honestly, is difficult for Ripple as well. Uh, looking at different data in different markets, uh, different regulations in different markets. You know, first and foremost, we want to provide, cons- or we do provide through RippleNet, consistent governance, backed up by simple technology to use at one set of APIs for doing all your payment use cases to all your different markets that supports the experience that you want. Real-time STP-based payments, um, you know, that that facilitates low-value payments and, and, and that drives the unit cost of additional payments towards zero because ultimately that is what will bring, you know, about our vision of the internet of value as you, as you push that yeah, zero transaction cost across the globe. Um, this is an important space. Now, what do we do in that space? We obviously work with financial institutions. Our governance is set up around what's called the RippleNet Committee, that is the financial institutions defining the overall governance, the legal basis, the operating rules for transacting on the network. We also utilize existing standards because one of the important principles are, you know, you we don't need to create new standards where they already exist. So we leverage ISO 20022 in the delivery of payment information uh, to support those payments. And that makes it much easier for banks and payment companies uh, to utilize Ripple in addition to other channels uh, they may have. It is critically important uh, and it is one of the major factors and value propositions of Ripple is simplification, standardization across the legal basis for transacting, across how do you transact with your parties, what's your rights and obligations on the network, what's the expected actions on the network, and across information and understanding that information. So it's critically important to the success and the value proposition of the network. That's awesome. That's awesome there. Um, We've, um, more on the technical angle now, um, obviously you've kept it simple. 
as you said many times there, just keeping it very simple for consumers or for the actual businesses you work with. Um, when you're developing this, um, the network and all the blockchain interaction, technically, do you have to change your development practices from traditional practices when working with it? Or is it the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of you know, blockchain in this space, it does bring about some differences. I think a lot of, so blockchain, certainly our work in the XRP ledger has been based off a of public community as opposed to enterprises. And I think that drives significant difference in development practices and and quality control and approach to quality control as well. Uh, we've certainly learned a lot about utilizing blockchain and, and aspects of blockchain within an enterprise uh, solution. And we bring about, you know, we utilize both traditional centralized approaches in addition to blockchain and elements of blockchain. And th that has shifted as, as we go as well. In terms of the deep development and, and the DevOps and things behind it, we obviously have a, a you know, dedicated team in that space and absolutely that is different to, you know, that, that continues to evolve. It has differences uh, based on, on the blockchain space, but a lot of its differences as DevOps itself has you know, significantly changed, certainly in the time that I've been involved in enterprise software, which is uh, quite some time now, <laughs> towards 20 years, of course. Um, absolutely, it's different. Um, it's much more community uh, driven and, and collaboration driven. Uh, you know, I think a major aspect also, it's not just the underlying you know, blockchain logic and approaches, but it's also the need for interoperability between systems. You know, legacy mm -hmm. systems were not built to talk to each other. It was sort of added on as, a, as an afterthought. Now everything needs to be connected, which creates new dependencies and significantly changes how you develop this software and these systems. Fantastic. And so to work at Ripple, for example, culture-wise and the skill sets, what do you look for? What sort of uh, people? Well, you have to be good looking, of course. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and a good haircut. Just, yeah. just kidding, of course. Uh, look, uh, we have many different people from different backgrounds. Um, I think towards two thirds of our team are in the engineering space. Um, you know, transactional systems, financial systems are part of that, but also, you know, getting new practices from, from different and in particular customer centric uh, technology spaces in, in the past, you know, is obviously critical to that. We have people like myself from the more traditional financial services space. Uh, my background is in financial services consulting. I worked for Accenture for about 12 years uh, across trading systems, custody banking, and payment systems. Um, I think you know, we, we also hire people from banks and other financial services. We hire people from legal backgrounds and from you know, regulation backgrounds. Uh, re the regulatory space is certainly uh, an important aspect of what we do, of course. Um, so I, I think the right balance across that, obviously you've got to be comfortable with discomfort you know the, the solutions always changing we need to listen to our customers and we need to adapt to that so you know th that's essentially the people we're looking for in terms of you know culture it's very inclusive uh you know it's very it's a have a go culture it's it's a get out there and solve problems provide your views where you know it's not very hierarchical um and you know, i think being able to work uh, dynamically in different teams on different problems is, is a key skill set to have. Oh, you already go, Carl. Sorry, I just took myself off mute. <laughs> no, that's right. I was like, I was thinking, I'm, I didn't know you were asking or not. So, interesting enough, so you've obviously got offices based around the globe um, and that uh, kind of works well in with what's going on in regards to the blockchain technology guys are building. Um, I mean, is there, are there plans? Obviously you have a roadmap in regards to refining and improving, but is there anything else you guys are working on uh, that using this technology? I mean, one of the big things that people have started talking about is also, you know, um, stock market, you know, things like shares and those sort of things as well. So is there any plan to sort of divest out from financial payments into other areas of the financial sector as well? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Obviously, you know, just locally here, ASX has had a, a long-term project, I think predominantly with digital asset around uh, blockchain, around the chess system, of course. Um, certainly there's an application of 
decentralized technology, be it blockchain or otherwise in, in different areas. I think early within Ripple's conception, we had a very broad, you know, back when we were actually Ripple Labs, it was a very lab type approach. We had to go at different areas. We had, uh, you know, a digital identity project. We, uh, we had a, a uh, smart contract, you know, project that was called Codius. So this is, you know, this is before the days of Ethereum. But, you know, in looking at these different things, we, we found a, a couple of, you know, different findings at a broad level. And one is you, you can't tackle all problems at once or even in totally. It's not even healthy for Ripple to solve all problems across these different spaces. We also found in looking at smart contracts in particular, firstly, a lot of, a lot of things that are proposed still for smart contracts today don't actually need smart contracts. They don't need autonomous logic. They just need better automation. And we found that the biggest problem we had in developing out automation and autonomous logic was the uncertainty of payments. So based on that, we very much focused on if we can improve the payment space, other people can utilize that and can um, build solutions in whether it's equity market spaces, whether it's other smart, you know, I know smart contracts is a very broad topic, of course, but in that space, if we can provide better certainty and other attributes of payments, um, then it can be a building block for these different pieces as well. Uh, we also, our CEO, Brad Gullinghouse, uh, was um, you know, very famous pre-Ripple for uh, you know, being a, a, a strong supporter of focus and you need to do something well rather than trying to do lots of things at once. Uh, so we are very much focused on payments. We're not really looking at other use cases in terms of uh, stock markets and these sort of pieces, but we are building a payments network. And that means more than just moving money from here to there many, many more things. And that's certainly a learning we've had, how to build an ecosystem around that, how to solve challenges in that space. One of the challenges, as an example, is not just how do I move money from here to there, but how do I manage my working capital? And that sort of has produced what we call on-demand liquidity as a solution that enables payments instantly into different corridors without any pre-funding. And we've now built on top of that a line of credit offering so that you can make payments now and, that, and they can be funded at a later point in time. And these are new product offerings that we've, we've brought, not to just solve payments, but to solve building a high performance payments business. Um, so I think that that's really where our focus is. Certainly we're very interested in how our customers can utilize you know, RippleNet as a platform as part of broader end-to-end uh, -end business processes, you know, be it stock markets or other spaces. Um, I noticed, um, let's, let's look at the Libra hearings last year, and I have to ask this question, it's more VC-based, obviously, but I saw um, your CEO in the media a lot talking about um, educating some politicians actually on, on blockchain in general, I noticed. Yep. Um, then later on in 2019, the $200 million of fund, funding round you had there, which is awesome, for the, it was the biggest of the year in blockchain. Does that, does that make you guys the biggest now? In blockchain in theory, you know? Or uh, well, I, I don't necessarily run the book on uh, or, or the, the uh, table. Ripple is certainly a, has a strong presence within the blockchain space, has been one of the earliest, you know, companies focused on use of blockchain for enterprises. Um, you know, 2012 was a very, when the company was founded, it was a very early stage of that. Um, in terms of the funding and size, though, you know, for us, we look at the size of the challenge and, you know, solving for cross-border payments across the, the world, you know, trillions of dollars locked up in, in these cross-border payments. It's a huge undertaking. And, you know, doing that globally requires a lot of resources. So it really provides us the opportunity um, to build the company we need. You know, part of that is, you know, opening the office here in Sydney in 2015, but we're now located in over 10 offices around the world. And we service, we've contracted in over, I think it's 55 countries in the world with, with different financial institutions. To do that at scale, to be in front of customers, to listen to customers, not just create a technology and, and publish it and say it's great, but to actually go into different customers around the world, that requires significant infrastructure and, and you know, the size of Ripple and our fortunate position in that funding uh, enables that. Um, so that's really what we focus on, the, the opportunity to make a difference on such a huge scale problem in terms of global payments. 
And, and obviously around from last year with Libra um, coming out, it's really started to educate um, some mainstream people and businesses and so forth. And the good thing was Ripple was in a good position before Libra was announced, uh, honestly. Um, so how does, how does the Libra announcement, and also it's been watered down since, what's your thoughts on Libra and where it's gone and, you know, impacting Ripple potentially? If not, if, if, I don't have to answer that, of course. But. <laughs> well, uh, look, I... I mean, <laughs> Libra was obviously a huge announcement and, and an event, you know, within the, the blockchain and indeed the payments and indeed the money space. Uh, the original announcement was a brazen, it's going to be a fiat currency replacement. Um, and that obviously had a huge impact on regulators. And we've seen a massive and I think a, a, unexpectedly massive backlash from regulators, at least for Libra and Facebook, which has been interesting. Yeah, Ripple's approach has always been very different. Uh, Ripple's approach has been, how can we build infrastructure that supports sovereign or fiat currencies and the, the existing markets and institutions within that? In terms of, of impacts, uh, you know, we definitely saw a lot of reaction from the market in the payment space. A lot of people saw the announcement of Libra as a threat. Um, they saw the opportunity to engage platforms like Ripple. We have had a lot of interest from institutions that are driving off, how do I make my business more scalable, more agile, and be able to compete against threats such as, as Libra proposes? Um, I think Libra has also brought about or, or been part of some positives. And one of those positives is, a focus on the end user. Uh, traditionally, payments, banking, and money have been about, you know, the focus has been on financial institutions. And I think the market has largely ignored last mile connectivity and the actual end customers. And you know, they've realized not just through Libra, but many other things, that that was a huge mistake. We've seen the advent of things such as digital wallets and more you know, customer experience and customer focused spaces. And the focus has moved away from the financial institutions are more to the end users. And that, that has been a good thing. And, and I think Libra has been about that. Why is Libra such a threat? Because they have such a huge end, you know, end customer set, you know, 2 billion people or whatever the users of Facebook are. Um, and yeah, you know, we've seen that in financial institutions as well, that they're, they're not just thinking about how they can operate better, but you know, how they can provide services their customers are asking for. Um, so I think that that's been a positive to come out of it. Uh, it's certainly going to be interesting to see how it progresses from here. Uh, the regulatory backlash has been, um, yeah, really interesting. Uh, and, you know, how Libra adapts, how Facebook adapts, and how regulators adapts will be, will be certainly interesting in the coming years. That's fantastic. But also, you just mentioned the regulation um, there. So Ripple working with regulators helps grow the business, obviously. Um, it also helps the ecosystem um, that is blockchain. But at the end of the day, it's not about the technology. It's about the outcome for the consumer and business consumers also. Um, are, you, are you guys working closely with regulators? Obviously, I noticed Bank of America was on your um, one of your boards there, um, to help there. And yeah, do you we, so we... We do work with regulators around the world. Uh, but, you know, I've stopped counting, but we, we did have a counting list of how many central banks and key regulators we've met around the world. And you know, there have been plenty. We, we, at times, educate them. Um, for most of our services, Ripple is a, a non-regulated entity. We're a network and technology provider. Uh, we educate them about that. We educate them about our solutions. Some of the questions are, how, does that, how are they safe? How are they secure? Some of the questions are, how does this improve our regulated institution's ability to service customers' needs? So we do a lot of education around that space. We do a lot of engagement with central banks and regulators with our customers to get approval for different you know, services as well. Uh, you know, I've been to many of the institutions you know, around, in particular, Asia and the Middle East which is, and South Asia, which is where I've worked. Uh, I've had, you know, we've had services approved in places such as working with uh, the Central Bank of, of Bangladesh, as an example, you know, how we can um, build services into the country, uh, how we can uh, align you know, or help the, fi the regulated financial institutions align to the regulations there, and how, can we, can, how we can better enable them to, to meet the re regulator's objectives. So regulator engagement is, is obviously a huge part of our business, and um, 
you know, has been for many years and in many different countries, of course. Big area as well, I guess, is like we mentioned before, you have established players in the market who effectively have a lot to lose, you know, from, you know, companies such as yourself, things like Libra, things like Bitcoin. So do you think there is a resistance, you know, that's a bit of fear mongering that goes on whenever new technology comes along that can offer solutions because established players, you know, don't quite have the jump on other companies, so to speak? I think there's a dynamic there, and this is probably all sort of markets and all technologies in different spaces. Uh, you know, you get different reactions out of different players. Uh, some of them see it as an opportunity to improve themselves. Uh, some of it see it as a threat uh, as competition. And, you know, I guess my role is, is about pushing financial institutions more to the former and seeing that as an opportunity and how they can utilize it. Um, some of those big players we work closely with, we work closely as an example with MoneyGram, you know, one of the largest uh, money transmitters in the world. I think it's potentially second behind Western Union. Um, so some of them are embracing it and seeing it solving many of their challenges. Uh, you know, some do see it as a potential threat. Um, but even if it is seen as a threat and, and, you know, pushes institutions, you know, certainly the incumbents, to build more innovative services, I certainly see that as a positive as well and bringing positive outcomes to the consumers. Awesome. Sorry, Michael, please go ahead. I don't want to... No, you go. No, no, it's all you, mate. Go ahead. That's all right. <laughs> From a personal perspective, um, obviously, we've been talking a bit, you know, about, you know, technology using blockchain. From an investment standpoint, you know, do you think there is now more of an alternative market starting to open up in this area than we've seen before? Like, traditionally, it's usually, you know, high net worth individuals might have property, um, mixed investments, and they've got maybe, you know, like we mentioned with a couple of the guys we had on here before, there is that area of, you know, some high risk, high reward um, investments. And and I think looking at it now, that's starting to really open up and be more accessible to everyone. But again, I, I think the problem that I've seen is we don't have a centralized place for the education. And I think Michael, you probably agree with this, the education and understanding of, you know, non-fiat based currency and how it can have a positive impact. So do you think there should be more of an open source way of looking at this and creating a, a large community that combines these things? I mean, just for example, Ethereum kind of span off from people who are dissatisfied with Bitcoin. And if you talk to one or the other, you're not going to get any sort of happiness between them. So, I mean, is it up to us to kind of bring people together and say, hey, look, there's a common goal behind all of this, which is, you know, um, better payments, you know, more transparency, less manipulation of currency, you know, is that kind of lacking in the market, you think? Oh, I, I think there's always going to be a, a sort of knowledge gap and there's going to be a, a space to fill that. There is a lot of information out there. In some ways, there's too much information out there, you know, which makes it also hard to, to learn in this space. I think the first thing to understand is that, you know, that's really important to understand in assessing the, the sort of market and, and, and an understanding of it is, these digital assets, these networks, these technologies are substantially different, right? Um, blockchain is somewhat analogous and actually is a database, right? And it's like saying, do you have to understand database to understand? You know, different applications sitting on databases work in different ways and do different things. And yeah, you know, that, that's the case for the different digital assets and networks that exist today. Uh, we obviously have been a key part of building XRP Ledger uh, you know, specifically tuned to payments problems. Uh, Ethereum has different attributes and different ways that it works and, and different use cases that it, it's used for. Bitcoin has a different one and the other one. So you need to understand all these different digital assets are, are different. I think, you know, there needs to be a, some level of understanding of the technology, but there needs to be a broader understanding of the markets, uh, what the utility of these different assets are. It is a formidable space from the outside, but it's very interesting. And I think it's certainly going to be very relevant to the future. Uh, so the opportunity is there. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think when I compare, when I joined Ripple, which was in 2015 to now, there is a much better, you know, broader understanding in the community around both the technology and, you know, the, the digital asset markets themselves as well. And also so hopefully that continues. Oh, definitely, for sure. Um, because you have a bit of a global uh, perspective on things and obviously living in Sydney, um, how do you feel Australia sits now with adoption? 
not just blockchain, but a bit more of innovation. And then obviously the US and Asia and Europe, for example, where, where do you think Australia sits at the moment? Uh, interesting question. I think, you know, in looking at the digital asset space, you know, Australia has taken uh, good, strong steps. I think one of the major things is the licensing regime by Austrac for digital exchanges it is, you know, very progressive and, and provides you know, a great market. And that's one of the reasons that Australia is one of the limited markets that we have our on-demand liquidity you know, solution available. It requires uh, a level of certainty within the market, which the regulated, regulatory um, setting, and in particular that licensing of digital exchanges provides. Uh, in terms of, you know, different markets will have different positions on um, cryptocurrency or digital assets. Uh, we've recently been very clear that we we see a lot of problems in the uncertainty within the US regulatory space. Not so much a the rules are onerous. The problem is the rules are unknown. And you know, there are publications we've seen in the US recently that name seven different regulators, all of which have different views of what a digital asset is and, and how it should be regulated. And that's not an environment that is good for business. Um, it's not about having softer regulations. It's just having consistent and clear regulations. Whereas, you know, some other spaces like UK, uh, some of the Asia, you know, countries in Asia are much clearer. In terms of more broadly in financial services, um, my, my view is that Australia has a very conservative financial services sector, let's just say, um, you know, more conservative than most of the other markets we work in. And, and you know, we work in cross-border payments. One of the challenges we have in Australia is Cross-border payments are a small part of the uh, certainly banking and even non-banking space. That domestic services are much more prevalent. You know, I talk to a bank in Australia about cross-border services, and it might be I don't know five to ten percent of their revenue. I talk to a bank in Philippines, and it's probably sixty percent of their revenue. So obviously, there's a lot more propensity to innovate in that space um, and to build new services in that space in Philippines versus Australia. So that's kind of natural. Okay, so Asia's really somewhere you see. see Asia, definitely. I mean, Asia, Asia's definitely hot in this space. It has a huge dependent on cross-border and cross-currency movement of money uh, between the countries there. Uh, but we see many other spaces here. We have a lot of services and we see a lot of activity in South America as another example and LATAM as a whole. Uh, Middle East has been very strong for us as well as the subcontinent. Um, yeah, we, we, we're seeing growth and interest and a need in, in you know, pretty much all parts of the world, which is understandable in cross-border payments. But in these areas in particular, we think our message and value proposition particularly resonates. Right. Fantastic. So where, what does the future look like uh, for Ripple and obviously blockchain and innovation that way? So where do you think you're going to go? Or happening, growth, further growth? Yeah, I mean, obviously we, we want to continue to build, uh, you know, the, the Ripple net as a network. Um, a lot of that is bringing on, you know, new members onto the network, providing, you know, building new services on that network, uh, you know, growing the transaction volume uh, on that network is, is a key uh, undertaking for us. And, and part of it's also building on new value within that network. So I talked before about the adding on on-demand liquidity, opening up new corridors in the on-demand liquidity space. And of course, now our line of credit offering and ensuring that that's available to institutions uh, that need it and, and can use it to solve uh, you know, working capital challenges. So it's about building the network. Um, you know, it's about in continuing to work with members of the network to build the overall quality because it's not just about technology or even the governance structures, but it's about the participants and, and their capabilities as well. So I think that that's where our focus certainly will be uh, in continuing to uh, deliver value, not just to the financial institutions on the network, but in particular their customers. And hopefully moving towards that uh, internet of value uh, vision eventually. Um, and I think we've made significant progress towards that, but it's a very big, as I said, undertaking. And uh, luckily we have the resources and opportunity to tackle it. Wonderful. Well, Ross, I just want to thank you on behalf of myself and Michael for joining us today. It's been really, really interesting listening to what Ripple's currently working on, you know, the future of payments. And it's wonderful to see success. I mean, you guys are present over 40 companies. You've got over 500 employees. So, I mean, it's obviously a, quite a large movement and people are starting to really jump on board. Um, you do have some large financial institutions that are also buying into this. So, obviously, people are seeing the value and 
obviously it's myself and Michael who are really interested in, you know, the technical side of, you know, the, um, the payments and the Bitcoin scenario that's ongoing as well. We're going to obviously be watching this space very tight. So we'll definitely have to have you back on the show again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, both for the time. And it's always good to talk about these topics. And in terms of Ripple, it's certainly been an exciting five years to date. And uh, Ripple has changed. The market has changed. And uh, I'm sure that will continue into the future. So I'm certainly looking forward to seeing uh, you know, the, the future challenges and opportunities that we can tackle as well. Awesome. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.